How's everyone doing? Nice to see you all. I'm going to do a, um, a bit of a talk on this, and I thought you'd be interested. And this is actually going to be tomorrow's podcast topic. But um, those of you who are not familiar with my podcast, you might find this kind of a, a useful topic to, to give you a flavor. So we're talking about the impact that refugees are having on the Irish housing crisis. And um, as I normally start, start my podcast, what's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode. Today's topic is a controversial one. And I don't, you know, I don't hold controversial views on this particular sort of topic, but I did post recently uh, in my social media about it on Saturday at lunchtime. And today that video has almost 30,000 views and that's in just 48 hours. So it gives you just an idea how, you know, topical it is that people have all jumped in on top of this. Um, going viral on TikTok is not that difficult. All you have to do is post something that is very polarizing and then just wait for the comments to flood in. And you'll always have a, you know, you'll have comments that are, it, it's this, everything is black. And then you'll have comments that everything is white. And so that's typically how it works. If you want to go viral, find a topic that is going to divide people. And then you're going to hear a lot of views on all of that. Anyway. Um, interestingly, the exact same post that I put, I put the exact same post in TikTok and I put it in Instagram. And the same post in Instagram only garnered 1,300 views compared to 28,000 in TikTok. And so I guess that's what makes TikTok such a powerful t uh, platform and why Meta and all of these other companies are all quite fearful of it. Now, part of the... Um, the, you know, the, what has attracted all this sort of attention and all of this controversy is I posted about this article I read on breakingnews.ie. Now, this article came out on Friday, the 26th of January. And this article was, it, the headline was that independent Kerry TD, Michael Healy Ray, had received over 658,000 euro, including VAT for accommodating Ukrainians to date. Now, he owns a property, a guest house in Kerry, in Tralee, I think it is, and it's called Rosemount Guest House. And between the 1st of July and the 30th of September last year, 2023, he received 114,000. And then Last year, he was actually turned down for planning permission. He applied to add a three-story extension to this house. And uh, obviously, he wants to increase the capacity because he's making a lot of money from this property. But 658000 in revenue generated since you know, from Ukrainian refugees since the start of the war. Now, this was part of a total, and this is, these numbers are quite staggering, uh, a total of 320 million euro was paid out by the state for housing Ukrainian refugees from the 1st of July to the 30th of September, 320 million. And an additional 168 million was paid out during the, this same period. Uh, that's the 1st of July to the 30th of September. And that was for international protection applicants. And I guess what that means is sort of non-Ukrainian refugees sort of from other countries and also asylum seekers. So the total paid out in the nine months from the 1st of January to the 30th of September last year is 869 million. That's just to accommodate Ukrainian refugees, plus an additional 469 million. And that was to accommodate this other group of international protection applicants. And when you add those two figures together, that comes to 1.33 billion in the first nine months of 2023. And the article actually breaks it down even further. It says that City West Hotel, and anyone who's been out to City West Hotel knows it's a big kind of place. You know, they had weddings out there a lot. They had a golf course around it. It was the kind of place you would put on 
business conferences and stuff, they have made 24 million uh, in the last in in that period of time in housing Ukrainian refugees. There's a place in County Mayo called Briefy or Breffy House Resort that's made six million. There is um, the former Monaghan GAA football manager. He has earned 28.7 million. His properties, a company that he controls in U- housing Ukrainian refugees. Travel Lodge Hotels, which is the, the, you know, the hotel group that you see on the sides of the motorways. Travel Lodge, 21.6 million in uh, for housing refugees. And then Heronwell. Heronwell is a company set up by a Lucan man called Derek Scully. And he started the company. It was incorporated on the 25th of January, 2022. So that is just two years ago, like literally almost to the day. And that company has generated revenues of 9 million. And it goes on and on and on. It lists lots of different places. I'll put the link in the show notes for the podcast. I did not post this TikTok video. Uh, I did not post it for controversy, and I did not post it to generate any hostility towards any group at all. Um, you know, I'm very open-minded. I don't have any kind of axe to grind here, but it does put a lot of things into perspective when you consider 1.3 billion in the first nine months of 2023, and that when you compare that with the uh, Crumlin Hospital children's hospital that's under construction at the moment. And there's all sorts of controversy over the fact that that is going to cost more than two billion. Um, And you kind of say, well, you know, but at least at the end of the process, we're going to have a world-class facility. Whereas all of this money that's been spent housing Ukrainian refugees, it's been spent in a very, you know, kind of haphazard kind of way, just there's nothing to show for it. I mean, you're obviously accommodating people, so that is something to show for it, but you don't have a facility at the end of it, and people are living in pretty sort of poor conditions in many cases. I hear there's, you know, there's tents and there's all these kind of like uh, hostels set up. But I was going down through the 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 comments that, it, you know, the, the video attracted a huge amount of comments and a lot of negativity, a lot of hatred and stuff like that, which... You know, it comes with the territory. But when you go down through the comments, you see some pretty clear themes and patterns. And I'm going to kind of point out a few of them. First of all, the most common theme that I saw was talking about connected people. And in particular, this kind of suggestion that the politicians and the TDs are corrupt and they're in on this in some way. And, I, you know, obviously people, when they see somebody like Michael Healy Ray making 650 grand, it does straight away make people go, ah, of course, you know. But the reality is, is anybody who owns a guest house is going to be doing really well at the moment because of the housing crisis and the the, the need to house all of these refugees. And if you owned a, you know, a, if you're just happen to be in the right place at the right time, you have a, a hotel, a guest house, whatever it is, you're going to be doing well. In the same way as I remember visiting New York City back in the day, and that you know during the summer they have these downpours where the the rain just comes down in you know torrents, and it's it's like being standing under a waterfall. And there's people out there selling umbrellas, and the umbrellas, you know, you do anything to have an umbrella, and you pay whatever you pay. The guy can charge whatever he wants, um, and the br- umbrellas last like one journey. You basically walk across the street holding the umbrella, and it's it's broken by the time you get to the other side of the street. But those guys that are selling those umbrellas, like it's not so easy to sell an umbrella on a dry, sunny day. So you're making money while the rain is falling and then that's it. It's gone. And it's the same for the guest houses and the hotel owners to a degree, because if you consider not so long ago, these very same people were nearly put out of business by COVID and you had a two year COVID lockdown and like all of these guys were on their knees, no guests, no travel, no. And so, I mean, apart from the fact that maybe some key workers in hospitals and stuff needed to be accommodated, you're not going to have a huge amount of people 
that did well during COVID that are in the hospitality space. So we have to remember that. I think it killed off a lot of hospitality businesses. Now, so I don't blame anyone for trying to make money while the hay, you know, make hay while the sun is shining, as you might say. Um, all good things come to an end. And there's no doubt in my mind that this kind of, the sense of this bonanza that's kind of going on, and that's what I actually called it in my TikTok post. I said it was like a bonanza. But the reality is, is it'll come to an end. And when it does, anyone who has gone out and spent a lot of money acquiring different you know, properties in order to do all this accommodation, they're going to have to pay for those and there's going to be debt on them and stuff. So, you know, we'll have to wait and see as the time goes. But the other pattern that I'm seeing is this real anti-emigrant, anti-refugee uh, sort of hatred. And it's really prevalent. And a lot of people saying like that the war in Ukraine is not our problem. And so we should just close our borders to all refugees. It's their problem, not ours. And just, you know, to, to you know, good riddance to you lot. It's nothing to do with us. But this completely ignores the history of this country. Anybody, you know, who studied it in an Irish school knows about the, the famine, 1946, 1947, 1948. It was that period of time when millions and millions of Irish were forced to emigrate or starve to death in Ireland. And they all went to the UK and they all went to the US. And our population back in the 1840s, the late 1840s, was 8.5 million before the famine. And afterwards, it was around 3 million. So, you know, five people, 5 million people, sort of 2.5 million left the country and another 2.5 million died. And so it was, it was a pretty tragic period. And we have to remember that that the entire population was in this difficult situation and we were forced to emigrate. And when you're forced to emigrate, you have only the clothes on your back and you arrive you know, into this other country that you're hoping will welcome you. And they're not always that welcoming. And indeed, if you go back to those days, the Irish were not welcome you know, because there were so many of them. And I can remember seeing, sign, uh, seeing old photographs of signs on the windows of doors uh, in you know bars and stuff like that and it would be no dogs no blacks and no irish and that was you know the, the position that we found ourselves back then so i think it's only right that we don't turn our backs on that history and you have to turn around and kind of think look we were in that situation back in those days and we were taken in and then how would we you know what, what would wouldn't it be kind of disappointing if we were to turn our backs now on people that were in the same position um obviously the fires and the blockades and things like that that's people taking some really extreme measures and that is really disappointing uh you know i i understand people are kind of get angry and stuff like that but you know when it starts risking people's lives it's it's kind of problematic and um, the main reason i focused on this issue though is because here in this country we have a major housing crisis and it is creating a brewing political storm around it. And over the, num you know, over the numbers of refugees that are being admitted, continue to be admitted into the country. And it's because of this you know, political hot potato, we might call it, um, that we have the opposition parties in Ireland um, really having a field day and you know, giving the government a really, really hard time about the way they're handling this situation. And, you know, there might be some justification for it. But the big problem that I have is what you call populism. And that's when, you know, you see it in the US with Donald Trump and stuff like that. You see it in various countries around Europe at the moment. And a politician comes along, chooses a topic that fires people up, that gets a lot of kind of po po polarization. And a lot of, you know, people hold very strong views on this. And what they do is they'll go and they'll make all sorts of promises out. This wouldn't happen if we were in charge and we'd be able to fix it and it would be really simple to fix and stuff. And when you see, if you look at using the US as the example, Donald Trump, like he gets everyone fired up over the migrant issue, which is similar to what we have here. And the absolute hypocrisy of Donald Trump not allowing migrants in is that 
he is himself from a migrant family. His grandfather was German and they migrated to America back when Donald Trump's father, Fred, was a child. And so Donald Trump is from, you know, he's a migrant from a migrant family. And so it's so hypocritical that he's out there now saying all these guys shouldn't be allowed into the country when he himself was the beneficiary. If the policies that he's trying to bring in didn't have, were in existence at the time when his grandfather was looking for a place to live, Donald Trump wouldn't be an American today. So that's what bothers me about this populism. Now, a couple of my own observations. Small landlords are leaving the uh, housing market in their droves in recent years. And why is that? Well, it's because there's an awful lot of restrictions and the housing crisis has created a lot of these restrictions. There's rent control zones and there's all of these kind of, you, you've got the, the RTB. There's a lot of rules and regulations. There's a lot of taxation. And all of this makes it very def difficult for kind of a small non-professional landlord, we'll say, to make ends meet. And then at the same time, you see somebody like Michael Healy Ray able to bring in 650 grand in nine months, uh, or I don't know how long that period, I think it's nine months. It's just, it's just incredible when you think about it like that. Now, I'd like to talk about, whenever I talk in my podcast, I like to cover the, the power of the mind and mindset and things like that. And there's definitely an aspect of this that we have to kind of consider. And that is that you can empower or you can disempower yourself simply by the you know your thoughts. And a lot of people will be out there looking for property to invest and they'll be saying, there's absolutely no bargains out there. Everything is overpriced. And yet there are people, and so people are leaving the market and all of this kind of stuff going on. And yet you see a company like Heronwell that was established in 2022, January, so just two years ago, and it has generated 9 million in revenue since then, just two years in, and that is housing refugees. So there's definitely opportunities out there so if you go out and you say to yourself, no, there's no opportunities out there, then maybe you've just, you've got a closed mind and you have to think about, you know, the power of the stories that you're telling yourself. If you're telling yourself it's not possible, well, then that's what you're going to believe. But if you're telling yourself, hold on a sec, this guy over here made 9 million, there is a way to do this and I just have to figure it out. And all it is is that you haven't figured it out yet. Don't get into this stuff that, everybody is corrupt or everyone has got some sort of an inside track or you know that is negative self-limiting beliefs if you if you think that it's all about corruption and if you think it's all about people in the know and people who are connected and stuff like that then you'll just think to yourself you'll be cynical and you'll say you know what i'm not going to bother because it's it's a rigged game and that's like donald trump going on about the rigged elections and stuff like that now, that is the first thing to think about. And uh, obviously, when I say 9 million in revenue, you have to bear in mind that's revenue. That's not money in the person's pocket because they have costs. They probably got debt on the properties. They probably got management costs and stuff like that. And I think they've declared a dividend of 3.9 million. So clearly they're doing well, but at least 5 million of that is probably cost. Now, the housing crisis, let's talk about that for a second. The housing crisis goes back to 2008, the crash of 2008. And that is back when the, the banks collapsed and the property market went down and it took with it the construction sector. And at the time, I can remember the construction sector, they say that one in every two jobs was lost in construction. But it's actually worse than that because I've, I know guys that had company that, that had, say, a plumbing business. And they had 16 people working for them. And today, that same company, it's the same business person, uh, has only four people working for them. And you say, why don't you hire more people? You can't get them. And all of the people that he, the 16 people he had working for him, four of them were left, 12 of them went off. They either emigrated to another country and they were welcomed in those countries, or they retrained themselves and they got jobs in like the tech sector or pharmacy sector or something like that. And they're better paid and they don't have to be on building sites all day. So there's a lot to be said for it. But what's happened is 
that the construction sector has shrunk massively because of that period of time. Nothing was built in Ireland for a period of about five years. And in that period, what are you going to be? Long-term unemployed for five years or just go to another country and start again? And that's what happened. But in the meantime, population continues to grow and needs to uh, continually add housing stock in order to support that population. And in addition to that, like, like people born versus people die, I think something like 33,000 people were born last year, more than died in the same period of time. And 140,000 people migrated to Ireland last year. Now, a lot of people be saying, oh, that's the, you know, that's the refugees. It, it is not actually the refugees. It is 70,000 about of, of refugees, but another 70,000 approximately were people that were coming here because there's work for them. And they, they're from another country, but we need these migrants because a huge amount of tech companies, they need more and more staff. And that's what's fueling our economy. So we have to think about that. Um, also, we've got densities. Like as population has grown, you've got properties that were kind of, you know, small, two stories, and they're being replaced now with larger blocks that are kind of eight floors. There's all of this conspiracy stuff out there that I read in the, in the comments and the videos and stuff. And they talk about this conspiracy that the politicians in government want to keep supply down to push prices up for their pals and stuff. This is complete nonsense. The reason I say that is because we would build as much as we could build if it was possible. Nobody's holding us back. It is just literally the capacity of the construction sector. And don't forget that the government stands a chance, a strong chance now of actually losing power in the next election because of the housing shortage and the housing crisis. And if they didn't, if they wanted to stay in power, they'd obviously boost supply, but they can't do that just by clicking their fingers. The reality is the housing crisis is a really, really complex issue. It's not going to be solved very easily. Construction capacity simply doesn't exist because of the stuff that I've already mentioned. We need to build 60,000 houses a year. We're building 33,000 houses a year. We used to have a capacity capable of building 90,000 houses a year. And, you know, that's that's a big problem now. We've gone from, you know, 90. It went down as low as eight at one stage. And then over the years, we've been growing back, but we're only at 33 and we need to be at 60 just to maintain any kind of an equilibrium. Now, the planning system is also a major, major mess in this country. Such long delays um, to get planning permission. And, you know, there's thousands and thousands of schemes that are being held up by planning delays. And there's also, if you saw that TV show uh, not so long ago, there was actually a there was undercover cameras involved and stuff like that. And they found these guys that were making these objections and they were, it was just a shakedown. They wanted money. Now, if we streamlined the planning process and if we streamlined the, uh, you know, the construction issue, if we managed to get the capacity going again. The question is, where do you put all the workers? Because um, that is a big issue because at the moment you've got no housing capacity at all. And so the issue could be that you bring in, let's say we wanted to bring in 20,000 workers tomorrow morning to start boosting the construction. Where would you put 20,000 people? That's the next problem that we face. And, um, and so that is one of the biggest issues that we have. Now, an idea, one of my uh, mastermind members came up with this, uh, Andy, and it was a really, really uh, something I hadn't heard of before, but it's the kind of extreme measures that I think the government, need, government needs to consider. And it's what they did in Australia. And in Australia, what they did is they start paying people 600 a day, plus free food and accommodation in order to get all the trades people and the laborers and stuff back into the country. And that was really, really, you know, that worked very effectively. In addition to that, they built these big labor camps. Now, Labor camps get a bad name because if you go, I lived in Qatar and in Dubai for a couple of years, and those were labor camps where a lot of these workers from Pakistan and India and stuff would be. And they were really substandard 
the labor camps like the accommodation to be six and seven people living inside a small room with bunk beds and stuff and they'd be you know hot bunking it as they say where a person gets out and another person gets in and stuff so really that's not what i'm talking about i'm talking about big resorts and almost like a huge big hotel with sports facilities and gyms and restaurants and all that kind of stuff and i've seen actually an example of it a place called sea ripple and if you google it it's cripple.com.au and i'm going to put a link in the show notes for the podcast but it, it's pretty amazing it's got you know thousands of rooms and the people they're only down the road from the city where they're needed and finally we get into the cost of building to the codes and the building regulations and the standards that we have and they've all become very very onerous in the last couple of years it's very very expensive to build houses and apartments nowadays i've just moved into a new house that we built ourselves and i can tell you like the quality is very very high uh, compared to what it would have been back you know in the in the 80s and the 90s and stuff and it's really expensive to build apartments so much so that actually if you build apartments you actually lose money on the sales the way that most of these big big developers the way that they make money is on the housing units not on the apartment units and um, but they're forced to build the apartment units because the densities are have to be at a certain level for the uh, government or for the planners to accept the scheme and so you have to build something at a loss in order to make an overall profit and um if you look at the scheme like that and you're you know we've we've actually looked at schemes where you just can't make it work financially because of the cost of building out the apartments especially if you have a uh, basement parking or something like that building a basement is enormously exp expensive and it's very very difficult to fund a deal um one of the ways that we got around this in the last couple of years has been what's known as prs and prs is the uh, private rental scheme and that is where the big funds come in and this is very unpopular again they're i think they're calling them cuckoo funds where they come in and they buy up an entire block of apartments or something like that but the reality is is that the developer would not make any money selling the apartments out to individuals but they can make money selling it in a single lot to a big fund because of the way the fund finances it and so that has been working in the last couple of years. The issue we have is that population continues to grow. Um, we have over 140,000 people came into Ireland last year. And these are coming to work for the big tech firms. We need to keep the economy growing. And so we need to keep migration going. And so we need more migrants, not less. And the problem is, is that, you know, where do you put them is the big issue. And so I think the obvious answer is that we've got to figure out how to boost housing, how to get, you know, these tax uh, incentives to kind of make it worthwhile for developers and also get the planning efficiencies going. The Ukrainians who fled, you know, certain death in, you know, certainly if you look at the devastation that's been done by Russia in Ukraine, I mean, it's pretty devastating. Some of the cities have just been completely flattened and there's clearly no way anyone could have lived there. And you couldn't blame somebody for wanting to, you know, leave that kind of danger. And most people don't want to live, or most people don't want to leave family and friends uh, to go off to another country. But if you're escaping destruction, well, then clearly the question is, the destruction is so bad. You have to wonder how long will it be before these people can return? Because those cities are flattened and gone. And in, in some cases, maybe Russia will never give them back. And so you'd wonder if these Ukrainians living here now at the moment as refugees are actually going to become permanent settlers. And you've got to remember in America, there are over 40 million people that consider themselves Irish. And that's all because of the famine back in the 1840s. And so we have a population of 5 million here, but there's 40 million people who identify as Irish in the US. They reckon that by that Ireland will have a population of 6 million by 2030. So we need to build more houses and we need to get creative with policies and open-minded around how we go about all that. So I hope you found this episode useful. 
and uh, I'll see you in the next one. And now I'll go and check what's the story with all of the comments, because we have quite a few comments coming in. Let me just hit stop on the, that's the podcast recorded. And uh, so what have we got here? Let's have a look at, there's quite a few comments. So I'll, I'll go and jump into the comments and see. There's, I'm sure there'll be plenty. Oh my God, there's just millions. Um, so let's have a look and see if there's any questions or anything that is worth. Keep more likes can attract viewers. Keep it up. That's what it says. Okay. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. How many houses would you get for that? Uh, somebody said. What about this year? Are the government reaching out to property owners or vice versa? Look, everyone knows that this is the way it is, and I don't think that's going to change anything. Um, it's just that some of the accommodation is it's not suitable. The way Ireland uh, sells the houses should be illegal. I don't really know what you mean by that, like selling to funds and stuff like that. Like it's an open market, and the reality is the planning in the planning system we have all of these rules on us as to what we can buy and what we can, how we can sell. Certain amount of apartments are allowed to be sold and a certain amount are allowed to be turned into rental accommodation. And if a property is going to be turned into long-term rental accommodation for a fund or something, then it cannot be, uh, that cannot stop for a period of at least 15 years. So anyone who decides let's go and rent it out for a couple of years or something like that and sell it to a fund. That fund can't turn around and flog the property. They have got to do it to keep it rented for 15 years. So there is a lot of restrictions and stuff like that. Do I still develop in Soto? No, I've left Soto Grande, although I still have a villa down there. Wait until when? I don't know. I don't know that question. You are play the card you always play that card i don't know there's obviously a bit of a route it was 45 to 48 you're 100 years out on the famine yeah i think I, maybe i said 1948 um so are the government reaching out to hotel owners and vice versa yes like pretty much everyone knows that this accommodation like a lot of the problems that we have around the country in terms of tourism is that so many of the hotels are filled with ukrainian refugees that the actual people the tourism that's coming into the country and so if you think about think about say a place like kilkenny and i've read about this kilkenny has got all these pubs that people like american tourists will come in and they love to go around they'll spend money in restaurants and they spend money in pubs and they'll do all this kind of stuff but the reality is is that the hotels were so full of ukrainian refugees and those guys weren't going out spending money in the, the restaurants and the bars and stuff like that. And so that was creating a lot of uh, problems locally. And um, so the tourism business was down, even though the hotel guys were making plenty of money. Isn't the payment 800 per property per month? Um, yeah, I think that's what it is at. And so he's like, there may be different ways of accommodating like i don't know that is for somebody it's 800 per month per property but that is only in the case of somebody who has like a spare room or something like that but i think if you are a person that puts on meals and things like that you can probably create uh, additional revenues and things like that you must have a lot of properties yeah i i was doing that um affect politics <laughs> i was thinking that myself yeah it is like the there's, there's, you know, if you do the sums, you kind of think to yourself, geez, how many properties does the guy own? Um, U.S. cities grew in population between 20 and 40 percent during the famine. We've no credibility talking about 2 percent. Yeah, but don't forget the Americans had the population so they could build like, you know, somebody could just basically travel to those cities and, you know, the accommodation was there. The, the labor force was there should should be trailer parks like in the US. Yeah, the trailer parks, the thing is, is this is where the planning system is slightly problematic, is that we have got all of these rules and regulations around the quality of property. And I think, you know, in some respects, it's excellent that we have such high standards. But on the other side is this creates a problem. Like if you're not in a position to build, uh, say, trailer parks, and because those can be lashed up very, very quickly, 
and you can accommodate tons and tons of people um, very, very rapidly. But if it wouldn't pass the regulations and stuff, this is why I think we have to get creative and we have to start looking, having an open mind and starting to think about how is it possible to do this without getting into, um, you know, putting people into these really poor, poorly designed labor camps. Like there's a certain standard. Um, and I think prefabricated accommodation would obviously work. What is we have? We have fund the IPO to do quicker asylum processing. Nobody disagrees with that. Well, yeah, that's true. Now we're talking. Did you get into housing refugees? That's where all the real money, easy money is. Yeah, I never got into it myself, but I do know various people who are doing that, and it's you know it's it's helping them. Uh, normal landlords that would struggle were able to get an additional few quid by putting uh, Ukrainian into one of their rooms and um, the room might not rent as well in the market as it would that you uh, you'd have to pay tax and stuff like that so tax-free 800 a month was actually quite welcome anyone setting up migration centers should send them to live in an island in the pacific yet yeah, that's the kind of negative stuff that we're seeing and I'll, i see a lot of in the uh, comments what's the story on renting my property to refugees should i get a tax insensitive I'm not sure. I can't, you know, some of these comments, I don't quite understand the context. Uh, let's see. During the housing crisis, banks loaned out 22 billion compared to 22, they lent out 12 billion. Yes, that is a good point. But the thing is, is you can't compare the two really because one of the reasons that we the banking system collapsed was because it lent out far more money than was prudent to lend out. And if they had lent out 12 billion instead of 22 billion, probably the banking crisis would not have happened. Um, let me see. It started with a credit crunch, remember? Yeah, that was 20, 2008. I was right in the middle of it all. <laughs> it was a painful time. And you really want the bad news. We may never see a brown envelope again. <laughs> the housing crisis, we can't afford material to build. And we can't afford the no. We can afford we can afford the materials. It's just it is expensive to build a property, and it's not like people think that building apartments that you automatically make loads and loads of money. You don't. That it's actually quite tight. And the problem with these schemes is that whereas a housing, if you're building, we'll say a small housing estate of ten houses, you build, we'll say four houses. And then you sell those four and you build the next four and you sell those four and then you build the last two and you end up, you know, you don't have as much money out because you're getting income back in from the sales. And so you're kind of able to kind of manage your cash flow. Whereas with if you were building an apartment building in the same site, you'd probably need to build 30 apartments and a building with 30 apartments is quite a few million. You have to build the entire building. You might have to put in a basement, which is a few million, and then you go and build the whole thing, and it has to be completely finished before you can sell any of the apartments. You can't phase it because the building is still under construction. You know, the lower levels might be finished with kitchens and stuff, but people can't move into a building that's still under construction in the upper levels. So that's what the big um, financial burden is infrastructure isn't there for a lot of new houses that's absolutely true it's the planning system it's the infrastructure um work camps like norway yeah i would say probably norway and all these countries the norwegian countries often know what they're doing or the scandinavian countries i think it's tough times for construction industry as a whole yeah it is and um, we're seeing it out there engineer a way out of it love it yep why why is there such man from ryan ryan nice to see you again why is there such demand it's because of the housing crisis it goes it goes just goes back and six years nothing was built in the country effectively and meanwhile the population continues to grow so you end up starting again with a completely depleted plan, uh, construction system the construction capacity back in 2012 i think was 8000 units a year and yet we needed to build about 30000 at the time and then as the population continues to grow today, we need 60,000 houses a year, but we're only building 33,000. And so it's just going to continue to get worse. Let's see. Uh, 
I see 70 apartment sites for sale, 3 million. I don't actually know that site. Could you not sell the whole unit and then rent it out for 15? Yeah, that's what people do. You sell the entire unit and you sell it. You see, the difference is if you go and sell, let's say you build an apartment building with 100 apartments and you want to sell it to individuals that live in the area, that's 100 mortgage applications. That's 100 solicitors. That's 100 people walking and traipsing around the thing. And the property prices just about barely cover the cost of construction, if at all. Like sometimes they just it doesn't actually cover it. Compare that with a huge, big, let's say a German fund or a French fund or one of these kind of pension funds. They come along and you'll have a couple of people. They come in, they look at the building, they look at the numbers and they go, yep, that's fine. We'll give you one check, one solicitor, and that's it. The deal is done. But in addition to that, the way it works is it's because it's somebody's home, they have to get a mortgage and the mortgage is based on their income and all that. Whereas these big funds, they're, they've got cash sitting there and all they're looking to do is make an annual return that is above inflation. And inflation in, you know, back in 2020 or whatever, it was so low that interest rates had fallen down to zero. And so all these funds needed was to earn about 2% a year in order to actually make money. And so they were looking around for investments and they came along and they see Ireland and they see apartment building after apartment building. And if they were to say, let's pay just, you know, we'll, we'll give this guy an amount of money that represents, we say a 3% annual return for that fund. That actually is enormously profitable for that developer compared with trying to sell them off individually and having all of the hassle of dealing with a hundred different people. That's kind of how it works. Um, cut benefits to them is working well. Yeah, of course, there's all of those opinions. Opinions on auctioneering and property service apprenticeships in Ballsbridge College. I don't know anything about it, I'm afraid. What's my net worth? That's a good question. I'm not going to be answering questions like that. Foreign funds take all the profits. Well, yeah, look, the foreign funds are needed. You're not going to be able to fix the housing crisis without the foreign funds, because the reality is, is that those foreign funds have got access to, to money that no individual buyers would be able to do. And therefore, in order to build tens of thousands of apartments, we're going to need to build tens of thousands of apartments and sell them to these big funds. And I know it you know, gets people in the neck and they get kind of fed up with that. The one of the problems that I do see is the fact that these guys can take their profits abroad and so they don't have to they don't have to sort of pay any tax in the Irish system that's problematic and it's problematic because um they can just you know the the fact that the property that the money is not recirculating back into the economy however at the same time you got to remember that these these international funds they could invest anywhere like they can they're not looking they're not like looking for a locality and to build a uh, you know, a network or anything like that. They are simply thinking, where can we put our, where we can we get, where can we get the best return? And they'll be looking at somewhere like going into uh, the likes of the, you know, the Netherlands, or they could go to Asia, they could go to Philippines, wherever it might be. And so, if there's tax breaks in those countries and there's no tax breaks in Ireland, then they won't invest in Ireland. So that's one of the sort of negative aspects of all of this um what are we what are we what we are supposed to be a hub for is technology supposedly leading the way yeah i i get that where do they pay all their tax google TikTok. yeah but the thing is 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 there's there's the in there's the other side of it when it comes to google TikTok, all of these companies they all pay very little corporation tax if they were in america they'd pay 35 percent over here, they pay two or three percent, or maybe ten percent. But the reality is, is that the people they employ pay fifty percent tax. The VAT that they generate—that's income. Like all of these taxes do filter into our system, and so the Irish economy is absolutely booming because of all the tech companies. Even if people are unhappy with the fact that they pay so little corporation tax, farm. REITs can pay twice what an investor can. Yes, that's true. And that's one of the reasons why we have to attract them in because 
if we don't attract them in, we're simply not going to be able to get on top of the housing. Like, I think the housing crisis is going to be with us for years, but the only way to fix it is going to be actually bringing in these, um, these big funds. And uh, that might not be popular, but I think it's just reality. So listen, guys, I hope you've enjoyed that. That's about 45 minutes of a talk. And um, do look, check out the podcast. Um, you'll see links to it in my link tree in the profile there. And uh, I'll put links in the show notes if you're listening, uh, if you're watching videos on YouTube or anything like that. Guys, it's been nice to talk to you, and I'll see you in the next one. And um, if you have any questions, be sure to send a message or something like that. Thank <laughs> you.